Hey everyone, Drug Fox here. So tier lists have been something that's been talked about in the Smash community for almost two decades now. Which characters are top tier and which character is number one have been hotly debated. Is Fox really the best even though people say he loses to Marth? Is Jigglypuff really all that broken if Hbox is the only truly top puff? You, your friends, and all your favorite players have talked about all this and more. But I'm here to tell you why none of that stuff matters and why you shouldn't care about tier lists. Yeah, so you go to your friends, you look online, you see everyone talking about tier lists, and you wonder, like, why does this matter so much? You know, is this legit? Stuff like that, right? I think tier lists can be useful to promote discussion, which I think is maybe why a lot of people like them. For example, if I put, you know, Sheik above Marth on my tier list, and someone says, oh, how could you put Sheik above Marth? Sheik gets destroyed by Fox, and Marth beats Fox. I, I could, you know have a valid explanation for that, and that forces a discussion between us. And I think that's really valuable for learning. But even that value is ultimately rooted in like matchup specific discussion, more so than some broader statement that, oh, X character is better than Y character. Like what, what do I gain by saying Fox is S tier, but Sheik is B tier? It's like, what, is, what does that mean? Let's talk about like why you actually think that. And I guess the way I see it is there's like, good and bad parts to tier lists for sure but the problem is that when people post these tier lists and then other people see them and they use them they don't use it for the purpose of having a meaningful discussion they just use it to validate their own beliefs generally and even if you use it to maybe not validate your own beliefs you see someone else's opinions you're like huh i wonder why they think that that's cool and all but i think that same exact discussion could have been had without like the obsession with tier lists that our community often has so i won't say they're useless but there's definitely a bit of an unhealthy obsession among i guess the general populace and i'm not sure where it really came from but it's been a thing for a while i think that as a competitor they don't really matter at all honestly and the reason for that is just because when you're playing a matchup, the only thing you really should be focused on is just like how to win the matchup. I get questions all the time to the effect of, oh, you know, Sammy, what do you think of Marth Sheik? Oh, I heard you said Marth beats Falcon really badly. What makes you say that? You know, all these questions. And it's like, a lot of the times I don't have a good answer. You know, if someone asks me who wins between Vox and Falcon, I'm like, I've never thought about that in my entire life. The only thing I think is when I play it from the Fox side, I think, how do I do this better? And when I play from the Falco side, I'm like, okay, how do I do this better? If I'm playing a matchup, I'm never thinking, wow, this character is so bullshit or, you know, something like that. I'm always thinking, okay, so I'm playing Fox versus Falco. Falco's grab is not that good and his shield pressure is pretty risky if I have good execution. So shielding at mid ranges could be very strong versus Falco. You know, things like that. And I'm not really thinking, because what, what determines who wins the matchup might be something like, okay, well, what are Falco's mix-ups? What's the EV on this? What's the risk reward? But like, no human being can even remotely reasonably calculate those things. And I feel like trying to calculate it is kind of a waste of time. But what's not a waste of time is recognizing that maybe Falco does struggle with me if I shield camp a bit. And then, you know, from the Falco side, I'll think about it like, oh, well, Fox is shield camping me, especially in this mid range. How can I trick him into moving out of shield? Or how do I wait until his shield wears down to the point where it's actually valuable for me to try to attack him? When I say it's impossible to calculate who wins the matchup, it's just that there are so many variables that are hard to weigh, right? Each variable has a weight and, you know, putting those all together to a final answer is very difficult. I mean, I can tell you, sure, I'm pretty confident Fox beats Ganondorf. You know, that's no question in my mind personally. But when you have a matchup where it's less explicitly clear how one character interacts with another, I think it's a lot harder to determine. And that's why, you know, you have something like, you know, someone says, like, we'll take Marth Fox. That's the classic, right? When someone says, oh, Marth beats Fox so badly or Fox beats Marth, like, I genuinely, like, no trolling or anything. I have no clue what they're talking about. Like, I've been playing Melee for 20 years almost. I mean, slightly less, but like, I don't know what people are thinking about when they say, oh, Marth just beats Fox. Like, do they just think Marth outpunishes Fox? Do they think the neutral is in his favor? Do they think Marth edgeguards him better? Are they taking into account every single slide off technique? Are they taking into account ambiguous DI in every situation? Like, I I've heard people say so many things about the matchup, and I'm like, man, I have no clue 
what mix-ups there are when it comes to like how does Marth perfectly react to every fox dash range or like let's say he doesn't perfectly react he has to guess I don't know that the guessing is in his favor you know you hear maybe Leffen talk about it and he talks about how Marth just can escape lots of fox combos kill fox off a lot of hits edge guards him really well blah 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 but then I hear Shroom talk about fox Marth and I've literally heard him say fox just camps Marth and Marth can't do anything and I'm like I don't know what either of you are talking about I mean like Clearly, they both have very valid ideas. I do think Fox can play very hard to hit. And I do think Marth can escape a lot of Fox combos and edge guard him. But it's like, how, how you weigh those things is like ultimately what determines who wins. And I don't really feel like that's the part we should be talking about that much. We should be talking about how to play around them better. You know, if Dewan thinks Fox just camps Marth, we should be talking about, okay, what does Fox do to camp Marth? When I hear a lot of newer players talk, or see Reddit or Twitter, I've seen people say, oh, Fox can just, you know, 20XX. And I'm like, what does that mean? And they're like, you know, he's Fox. I'm like, no, I don't know. And they're, and then I try to get them to talk, and they just say things like, oh, well, if Fox plays perfect, he can just run away and never get hit. And I'm like, I, I don't think that's true. You know, can you demonstrate that to me? And I've heard people tell me he can circle camp on platforms. And I'm like, okay, if I'm Marth and you run around on platforms, I don't care. I'm just going to sit there and use up air and not get hit by you. And it's just crazy to me that like, you know, so when Dewan says Fox just camps Marth, I don't know what that looks like in his mind. I want him to give me more concrete things. Or when, you know, someone tells me that Marth can get out of all the Fox combos, I want to be like, okay, well, what if Fox mixes it up this way? Like, lots of people talk about how Marth SDIs up airs, but it's like, well, what if Fox up throw bears at 30, you SDI the wrong way, do you eat three more back airs and lose your stock, you know? There's just so many factors that nobody's actually talking about. They just make this big general statement. I'm like, okay, well, great. I don't know what that means. And I mean, I think coming up with a conclusion isn't helpful just because it's a it's an amount of energy, you know, that I'm spending on not improving. And what you conclude about a matchup will change over time as you improve, you know. Melee has been around 20 plus years at this point and the game's still being figured out. I, I've had, on, on like Marsh Sheik, for example, I've thought that Marth won at some point and I thought that Sheik won and that's flip-flop for the last 20 years. And it's like, what did I gain by like coming to that conclusion or having that opinion rather than just thinking about how to actually play it better? So I think that breaking it down in such a specific way can help everyone understand it a lot better and then can help with a tier list discussion that's actually meaningful or fruitful. And I think that that can be cool with like, maybe a tier list can be reflective of what our understanding of the metagame is right now. It's kind of a snapshot, I guess. And that's not a bad thing. I like, I like looking back and saying, how did people view the game in 2004 and 2010? You know, on my 2010 tier list, I put Ganondorf as eighth. I think that was very incorrect of me. But really, that was my understanding of the game at the time. And I think having that snapshot to see how our view and perspective has changed is actually very valuable. It's more what we do with that snapshot that's important than just posting it and saying, hey, this is fact, don't at me, whatever. Like, that's kind of a waste of time. So when I say something like, oh, I know for sure that Fox beats Ganon. And, you know, you're watching, you're asking, oh, well, how come... You say you can't calculate it, but suddenly you can be so sure. Well, I think certain things in terms of risk reward are very easy to figure out. So an easy example is in Fox Ganon. I think when Ganon is off the stage, he is probably dead a large portion of the time. I know how Fox edge guards Ganon. I've looked at Ganondorf's options. He doesn't really have any. On the flip side, when I look at uh, Ganondorf edgeguarding Fox, because I understand the edgeguard flowchart in this game and I've thought about it, I understand that Ganon has to guess a lot, and his option coverages are very mediocre there. So, for example, I might break it down by, okay, well, if they're both off stage, I think Fox wins that by a huge amount. So then we think about neutral or advantageous situations, and we think, okay, when both of these characters get these hits, what do they lead to? So for example, Fox hits Ganon, and I'm thinking, okay, he has Wave Shine Up Smash, he has Up Throw into Juggles, you know, stuff like that. And I think, okay, well, all of this eventually leads to Ganon being off stage, and Ganon just dies. And then I think, okay, well, Ganon, even in the most ideal scenario, let's say Ganon was even with Fox in neutral, which absolutely is not the case, he has to get Fox off the stage just to have an explicitly worse position than Fox has on him. I guess I also think that, you know, if we were to break it down further into the likelihood of how they hit each other and what the nature of the hits are, you know, I can look at, okay, 
How does Ganon hit Fox? Well, anytime he jumps, Fox can reactively shield or stay out of range. So for Ganon to get near Fox, he has to like trick Fox into maybe shielding or something and then win a second mix up where it's like, okay, I've jumped. Fox can clearly shield every time Ganon jumps and then Ganon has to land and Fox doesn't have to be in his range. And then Ganon has to guess again. And then even if he gets that guess, he has a non-guaranteed punish because his throw combos suck and none of his other moves really lead to combos into a very non-guaranteed edge guard. Now you flip the perspective, you look at it from the Fox side. Nothing Fox does against Ganon is reactable. Ganon is guessing at every range because Fox has such good threats. And then when Fox does open Ganon up, half his moves lead to these 40 to 80 damage combos that all get Ganon off the stage. So when I break it down like that, I think it's very easy to see that Fox does beat Ganon and I'm justified in having that opinion. But if I were to look at, you know, maybe Fox Sheik, a matchup, lots of people say, oh, Fox obviously wins. I think it's a little less clear because, for example, I think it's very hard to weigh how valuable Sheik's tech chase is in the matchup because Sheik's tech chase is insanely broken if she can execute it well. And because it's so strong, I find it hard to weigh the risk reward. While in the Ganondorf case, I think it's very easy to weigh the risk reward because Ganon gets a grab. He gets a essentially one third guess on where Fox goes. And then even if he guesses right, he doesn't even kill Fox. Like when both sides have a lot of unreactable things and both sides can set up those situations consistently, I feel like that's where it's hard to parse. Because maybe you'd have a character that has really good mix-ups, but let's say Fox can very clearly avoid all the situations where the character can set those up. That's one thing. But I think in something like Fox Falco, it's very hard to demonstrate or prove. You know, if I were to ask someone, can you sh demonstrate to me that Fox can avoid the set situations where Falco puts him in a bad guessing game for him consistently, or that Fox's, the guessing games inherently favor Fox risk reward wise, I think like nobody in the world would be able to actually demonstrate that. Well, in the Ganondorf example, you know, I broke it down for you in a way where I don't really think anyone could argue with it. And, you know, if you ask me, to write like a formal proof I could. It just like, it's kind of pointless, obviously. I think me going into depth like that when comparing it to how other people talk about tier lists is, uh, it's an interesting point. Cause like when a lot of people who do know a lot about games, the games that they're playing and that they're good at, say something like, oh, this character is bad cause X, they actually either intuitively or maybe consciously know everything I said, but they can package that all into a simple statement like, this character sucks because they get edge guarded, or this character sucks because their moves are slow. But really what they mean or what they're implying is everything that I said. But when you give that to the, you know, the casual audience, I feel like all of that is lost in translation. So then it doesn't help anyone do anything besides parrot that player's opinions, which is not what we want. And I think it would be very easy to explain to someone, regardless of their skill level or uh, experience with the game, something like, yeah, when Ganondorf jumps, he can't drift that far so you can stay out of range or put your shield up. But when Ganon is on the ground, he doesn't really have any threatening moves. So when we break it down in terms of threats, it's easy to see, and that can be a framework, you know, we use to think about the game. While if we compare that to Fox's grounded threats, I could tell you, hey, he has Running Shine, which is unreactable and goes very far. Ganon, even though he's quote unquote longer range than Fox, doesn't have any ground threats that go nearly as far as running shine, nearly as unreactively. I, I definitely think people should be talking more about situations like that. The TLDR for this whole discussion is that you need to stop worrying about tier lists. I don't want to exaggerate and say they're useless or that, you know, there's no point in coming up with your own tier list or listening to anyone else's. They're a good guideline. They promote discussion. But ultimately, if your goal as a player is to improve or understand something better, you want to focus on more specific, concrete concepts and worry less about the broad conclusions that you can draw from them. Hey guys, okay. I'm Sammy, aka Drug Fox, previous rank number 12 in the world, known maybe as a Fox and Sheik player primarily, but play all the characters. Currently, you might not see me competing in tournaments, but that's because I spend all my time coaching. I've coached tons of top players, you know, Swedish Delight, Zane, Ginger, KGH, and plenty, plenty more. So I uh, hope you guys like this video. If you like my video, you can find more stuff like this on my Twitter, support me on Patreon, and uh, make sure to subscribe to the channel for more content just like this.